Welcome, welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hey, everybody! Welcome to episode four. In this one, we're talking about how to build a successful blog and content strategy. And my guest today is somebody who, quite frankly, knows what the heck they're talking about. Yes, for those of you in the Divi community, you know he needs no introduction. Mr. Nathan B. Weller, the content manager for Elegant Themes, the creators of Divi. This interview, guys, oh my gosh, it is jam-packed with value from start to finish. We cover so many impactful tactics and strategies in and around blogging and content strategies that you can apply to your business right now. Whether you're doing a, a, a blog on your site or whether you do content for clients or even if you just write words in general, you're gonna get a lot of value from this episode. Nathan was very real and transparent and kind of gives us a peek behind the curtain as far as what they've done at Elegant Themes to help build their blog from, well, I'll, tell, I'll just tell you right now, back in 2014, before he took over, they were doing around in and around 300,000 posts and page views per month. Now, five years later, at the time of recording this interview, they're doing around 2 million posts and page views per month. Nuts. He talks about all the tactics and strategies they employed to help get, get those numbers and grow their audience. And I mean, it's, it's no doubt helped the business. And I've seen Elegant Themes grow tremendously over the past few years. So we get a peek behind the curtain as far as what it takes to do that. And the cool thing is like, I'm not going to be running a blog that big. You are probably not going to be running a blog that big, but all of the tactics and strategies that they use, we can apply to our endeavors as well. So what they're doing with millions of page views, we can do with hundreds or thousands. One thing I want to say too is hats off to Nathan in this episode because he gets very transparent about some personal things that happen too. He gets, you'll hear later in the episode, he got to a point where he basically was just completely burnt out and worn out and was taking too much on, but he rebounded from that very quickly. And that kind of led to him creating some barriers and some guidelines and standards to make sure that he keeps at a sustainable pace. If you have followed me for any amount of time, you know I'm all about keeping a calm and sustainable pace. So we get to hear about kind of what led up to that and then how he corrected some of those things and what he has done to make sure things stay sustainable moving forward, which he's done for several years now, and the blog has continued to grow. So you're going to get a lot out of this episode. I can't wait for you to hear this. Before we dive in, uh, since we're talking about elegant themes and partly about Divi, this episode is brought to you by my Divi WordPress Beginners Course. If, you, if you're just getting into Divi and WordPress and you don't feel like wasting a ton of time going through documentation and going through YouTube videos and tutorials and trying things on your own, if you want the most cost-effective and quickest way to learn Divi learn, and learn WordPress so you can start building websites, check out my Divi WordPress beginners course. I'd love to help guide you to be able to get started quickly and efficiently. It's a very low cost course and it's a very condensed and concise course as well. And I do keep it updated. I'm actually just about to update and add some lessons to it for Divi 4.0. You can lock in lifetime access now and every time I update it, you'll be able to check out those updates. And I would love to help you quickly learn Divi and WordPress so you can get going on building websites. All right, guys, without further ado, enjoy my very in-depth and super interesting talk with Elegant Themes content manager, Mr. Nathan B. Weller. Nathan, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for taking some time out of a schedule that I'm sure is very busy after the recent launch of uh, Divi 4.0. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Uh, always like making time for you and for the Divi community uh, as much as possible uh, to be on podcast. Uh, these talks are so fun to me. And you're right, it has been busy, uh, but always worth it to make the time. Well, I appreciate it, man. I'm sure a lot of the listeners appreciate it as well because we're going to talk about blogging. I know we're, yes. we're going to talk about how to build and successfully <laughs> run a blog. I was just telling you before we went live, most people are not going to be in the position of running a, a behemoth blog like Elegant Themes where there's a lot of visitors and a huge content marketing strategy. But what I figure we'll do is we can talk about a lot of strategies that people can employ for their blogs. And then I'm a big believer in blogging and doing content for clients as well, because it's a huge markup and an upsell for services for people in freelance. 
Before we get to that, though, for people who don't know you or maybe are new to Divi, can you just kind of explain your story and how you got into blogging and then subsequently how you got into working for Elegant Themes? Yeah, sure. And uh, sorry, I don't want to uh, derail things, but just as a note on something that you said now uh, once or twice is like the, the level thing, like big blog versus little blog. So I, I like to make this note early because we're going to talk about a lot of things and I don't want anybody to go, hey, you know, I'm running a tiny little blog or I just started my blog and, and none of this applies to me because I'm not enterprise or I'm not, you know, well established or whatever. You know, I want you to think about, you know, you just presented at Divi Columbus, which is our local meetup. There were maybe 15 people in the room, right? These are people in your physical presence and you spent, how long did you spend creating that presentation? Uh, I probably spent a couple hours putting it together, maybe, yeah. maybe three or four hours. Altogether. And it was built on top of courses that you spent a lot, lot longer than that uh, doing it. So some serious, serious effort went into that presentation. And, and I'm sure that your desire to do a really good job was was palpable. I'm sure you really wanted to bring a quality presentation. That was for 15 people. So if somebody is, is listening to this or watching this right now and they have a blog and they don't have Google Analytics set up on it, I want you to go set up Google Analytics on your, on your blog, get a read, look at your monthly, daily, per post audience, any of those stats, and I bet they're going to be around 15 or higher and if I were to tell anybody who's watching this or listening to this that, hey, next week I'm going to put you in a room with 15 to 50 to 100 people and you're going to have to you know, wow them with something valuable that solves an important problem in their life, uh, you're going to put a lot of effort into it and you're going to want all the tools at your disposal to solve that problem and to make a clear, uh, precise presentation uh, that they walk away going, wow, that person really came through. They really wowed me. So it, even if you're not, you know, blogging for, you know, one to 2 million people like we do at Elegant Themes from month to month, you know, these principles and the stuff we're going to talk about, they don't change. Uh, they're just as valuable for, you know, the brand new blog as they are for the enterprise. So I just want to start that off as a thing. Um, and now I'll jump well into the, the who, who I am and why I should talk like that. So my name's Nathan, <laughs> Nathan B. Weller, as I go by online. Um, I, I started to go by Nathan B. Weller, not because it's some, you know, like literary uh, tick or something I have. I'm not, not trying to be like uh, J.R.R. Tolkien or something like that. But uh, I just found out a few, you know, it was like 2008, somebody had, another Nathan Weller had bought every domain, every social handle um, was already taken. So I had to find a way to have my own identity online. So I just plopped my middle initial in there and I've tried to be consistent with that. Um, I'm a blogger. I've been blogging for ages. It feels like sometimes I started blogging about WordPress in the olden days. Um, there, let's see, 2009, I believe 2010 were like the first couple posts I did in WordPress, but I wasn't really consistent about it then. But, uh, if you've been around the WordPress blogosphere for a long time, the very first blog I ever wrote for was uh, WP Hub. Um, not around anymore. Um, or sorry, WP Mods. It was purchased by WP. That's right. WP Mods. Okay. Yeah. Really old school. Um, one of the first like influential WordPress blogs started by Kevin Muldoon. Um, he also started bloggingtips.com. And I've just been going strong ever since. So when you started blogging, did you, how did you get connected with them? Like, did you just start a personal blog? Did you reach out to them or did they just find you? How did that go about in the early yeah, days? I mean, I tell, oh, man, every time someone's starting and they're like, oh, I hate doing these like low paying jobs to get started. I'm like, I blogged for free for like years. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started off by literally just uh, focusing on the... So I took, a, I took a, an interesting route. I don't know if most people would want to do this, but my strategy was if I want to get paid well, the only blogs paying well are big, you know, because they, they're actually getting the traffic to support ads, et cetera. Um, or they have a product attached to them and they're doing well. So I thought, how do I get on those? You know, um, if, 
if the only way I can get on those is by having other big credits, then maybe what I should do is just offer to blog for free um, original content to bigger blogs and just work up, like get the biggest one I can get and then work up from there. Um, and so that's what I did. And I did that for like uh, two years. Um, obviously, I had another job at the time and I was just doing you know, a couple articles a week, uh, in my free time for, I was, I was just going to ask what you were doing. Yeah. I mean, I figure, cause when you're getting started, you know, blogging, when you're getting started, is not probably going to pay the bill. So what, what were you doing on the side or what what was your full-time job while you started? So my blogging? primary job at that time was uh, business development. I was working for a company, um, in, in Columbus here called go big network. And I think they're not around anymore. Uh, but it was actually like their parent company. They owned a few different websites. And um, what I would do is uh, we we generate a lot of leads for businesses and I would broker those deals. Basically, I would call people up. I curate email lists and, and different types of digital information products and try to sell them in bulk to um you know, to, to buyers who were interested in targeting those, those audiences. And that was like my, my full-time job. Gotcha. Now I'm curious when you decided you wanted to start blogging, was that because you wanted to escape that role or the nine to five, or did you just want to have freedom and be um, able to work from home or coffee shops? What, what was the, the, the genesis of your desire to blog? I just love creating content. I mean, I, I'm such a content creation person. Um, you know, like in high school, I went to a school that was sort of like half high school, half college. And I did it because they had this really unique schedule where it was like the first half of your day was regular high school. And the second half of your day, you basically got to take whatever courses you would be taking if you were, if you were in college. Um, and so everything was kind of accelerated in terms of pace, but I loved it because you basically just got sat down on this big computer lab with like camera gear and stuff in a, in a closet and you had this huge binder and it's your whole work for the whole quarter. And they're just like, okay, like we're going to check in with you every once in a while to make sure you're doing this stuff. But, um, and you're going to get graded on it at the end of the quarter, but like the pace that you do this binder is up to you. So I would like go through tag all the, the cool content creation stuff. And then I do everything else really fast. And I'd spend the whole rest of the time, like, you know, learning Photoshop, learning video editing, like trapping our camera and lighting teacher and making him teach me how to do stuff and spend like an absurd amount of time, you know, creating these little videos and, and doing stuff with my friends. Um, it's so funny. I actually just was on Facebook today. And I got an 11 year reminder of like content that was posted. And it was an old photo from, from back in the day from, from that time where we were doing experiments with content creation. So I have been a lifelong content creator. Um, I just love it. And so I wanted a job where I got to do that full time. And it wasn't just writing. It sounds like, right. You like the idea of content all encompassing with video yes. lighting and every, just everything graphics. I think kinds. for me, I mean the, the thing that really gets me up in the morning are is like stories and anybody that hangs out with me long enough will hear me talk about mythology storytelling principles of storytelling and the reason is is because i i'm a firm believer that um if you study you know like uh human evolution uh psychology like the evolution of our brain structures there's this weird thing that happened where like stories were the thing that um that bound people together for the longest time and and we've literally evolve to to crave stories even when we recount like something as mundane as the you know our day like we sit down dinner how was your day uh it takes the shape of a narrative um it's inescapable and so if i i'm a big believer in that if you can understand what makes a story compelling um all the different elements and you can and you can use those things in your daily communication and in your writing and your content creation you're just going to be a better communicator so um I love that craft of of using things that that are concrete, things that are real, that are science backed, that are um, studied in, in in the lab and psychology, all these different things, and actually using them in real world scenarios to be effective, effective communicator. 
And it's really, really huge in marketing and blogging and business, the mm -hmm. idea of using stories. Have you read Donald yeah. Miller's story brand? Uh, yeah, I have it right next to me over here. <laughs> okay. I just, I read that earlier this year and it's funny. It's like, as soon as I read it, one of my students actually recommended it to me. And then I was like, that sounds awesome. And that book, I almost think that should be a prerequisite for any web designer because mm -hmm. it talks about web design structure and the idea of how to basically brand yeah. your service or product within a story because you're absolutely right. But you know, humans are just attracted to a story. That's why we got, that's why we like movies and shows and things mm -hmm. like that. Cause you want to see a story. So absolutely. I totally agree. That translates to I'm, writing. I'm another huge, huge fan of uh, winning the story wars. That's a, it's been a great book for me. Um, and that guy, the guy who wrote that Jonah Sachs, he, uh, he was one of the first like viral marketers on online uh, like viral video creator, like on YouTube and stuff. And he actually used his, um, his experience with that and his knowledge of, of storytelling to, um, to really dissect what makes content online, online content, um, attractive and appealing. And so like, if, if you're in the space, I think it's even more like story brands, great for branding. Right. But like, if you're if you're online content creator and you want to know what are the elements that make content appealing and how does that intersect with stories, winning the story wars is a great one. Winning the story wars. Okay, cool. I'll I'll make sure I put that in the show notes. I'm going to pick that up as well. That sounds great. So I have a, did I have you, a review of it on my blog too, and you, we can link to that if you want. Yep, absolutely. Now, did you have that mindset from the get go, Nathan, or did that have to develop? No. Like the hundred percent developed. So crazy story. I was in. I was blogging for years. So, I was, and, and I went, um, I got hired by a studio, um, like a design studio out in uh, San Diego back in, I think 2012, 2013. And they wanted to start a publishing arm of their, of their company. And they brought me out to, to consult on that. And I had been blogging for a number of different design and WordPress blogs as a freelancer for, for years at that point. And I, kept running into the same problem everywhere. Um, it was that everybody was doing everything technically correct, but they were not growing. They were plateauing. And the plateau really seemed to be something that was like um, audience engagement related, you know, like they just didn't have people leaving comments. People weren't sharing their content. People weren't engaging with their content people weren't caring about their content. The search engines cared and, and they got a lot of exposure and traffic, but the traffic ended up not being very meaningful because people were bouncing and all this stuff. Mm. It was like, okay, you're doing the things correctly on a platform level. You're getting eyeballs to your stuff, but people don't care once they're there. Um, how do you change that, right? And that question was bothering the hell out of me for for so long. And so it was while I was on that consulting job where I figured out like, Hey, you know, if I really want to provide insight for, for this new client, I'm going to need to expand my horizons. So I was at the bookstore and I was looking just all over the place. And I found that's where I actually found winning the story wars. And that kind of opened up this whole idea of content, like online content, no matter what it is being, guided by narrative and storytelling principles. And then from there, I got way more academic. I got into its source material and I learned about, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell, Hero's Journey, uh, Seven Basic Plots by Christopher Booker, uh, you know, archetypes, uh, all that good stuff. So um, that was really something around like 2013 that I, I got real heavy in. I spent, in fact, I, I got so enamored with it that 2013, 13 to 2014, I took off work completely. I, uh, I moved home with my parents because I just thought, you know, I kind of, I've taken this technical blogging thing as far as I can. And if I really want to have a big career after this, then I gotta, I, I gotta take myself to college basically. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I, I bought like 40 some books on psychology, storytelling, content creation, um, just mythology, everything I could think of in, in that vein. And I spent a whole year reading, taking notes, uh, just like I said, taking myself to school basically. And, um, and then the first client I had after that was Elegant Themes. How old were you when you did that? Cause that's, that's amazing. That is a rare thing to do. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it sucked. <laughs> um, I, I imagine like you had 20... to swallow. Some, you probably had to swallow some pride, right? When you're hanging out with friends. And yeah, like, I'm, I'm yeah. reading a lot and, and living in my mom's bed. You know? <laughs> no, it was terrible. <laughs> I, I mean, I, if, if you're passionate enough to do it, I would recommend doing it. If you're questioning it, like I only did it because I was like stone cold certain. I was like, this right. is, I have to do this. Um, but if you're lacking that, there's no way you're going to make it because it was miserable. <laughs> well, it's all, it's also clear that that paid off for you and you were very dedicated yeah, yeah. to learning and really, I mean, you probably condensed what you could have done in four or five years in one year by doing that basically just yeah, focusing exactly. all your That was my hope. Not having to worry about having another business on the side to pay the bills because mm -hmm. that was mostly covered, I imagine. So elegant themes came next. How did how the heck did that happen? Uh, we talked about this in a previous yeah. interview where I interviewed you, but I'd love to kind of talk about that again, maybe in a little more detail, which I'll link to that as well. But how did elegant themes come about for you? Right. So I actually should say the elegant themes my first blogging client after that. Um, it was funny because and I almost got it got it by accident because after that whole year of of study and with the emphasis on storytelling and structure and, and psychological elements of story, I actually started doing something called story consulting. And I was working with, you know, writers and I, I was working with a, um, a theater out in LA and a film production studio out in LA. And I was actually helping doing story consulting for their, their scripts and stories. And I was also posting jobs online for like people to send me their novels and I just wanted to be somebody involved in storytelling and, and I was just really gung ho about it. And then I realized, you know, like my, my longtime girlfriend uh, was like, you know, you need to get a job again because uh, I want to see you back in Columbus. So you need to come back here. And I was like, okay, I'll start taking like, you know, I was like getting paid for the story consulting, of course, but it wasn't like as high volume as my blogging work would have been. Um, it was like, you know, I get a client, they pay me like three to $5,000, but I may not get another client for like a long time. Right. Um, and so I was like, fine, I'll start sprinkling in some blogging again. Cause I know I can get that. I get emails every week, people going, Hey, can you blog for us? So, uh, it was like the most mundane thing ever. I just opened my inbox one morning and, and Nick, uh, from elegant themes, our CEO was in, was in my inbox and he's like, Hey, I saw your. I've seen your posts on some of these other WordPress blogs. Would you like to blog for us? And this was late 2013. And I said, sure. Yeah, why not? And he's like, well, we just had this thing, you know, called Divi just came out and we'd like to, uh, as part of our, you know, like a new chapter in our company, we want to, we want to blog every day and we need some bloggers to commit to doing a couple posts a week for us. Would you like to do that? And I, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. So as a freelancer, I just started doing a couple posts per week and, um, you know, it's funny, like, I don't think there's necessarily anything like special about, you know, the, the blogging that I was doing, uh, just following all the normal best practices. But, um, if there's anything that like contributed to me eventually coming on staff, I think it was just that, you know, I, I was intentionally not taking other clients. And so whenever Nick would email me and go, Hey, we had a few people drop off this week. We need an extra article or two. Like, can you do it? I'd be like, Oh yeah, you're my only client. Sure. Mm. <laughs> and so like after a while, I just kind of became like the go-to person. And, and then eventually, um, well, it's actually not as straightforward as eventually I just came on because, <laughs> um, do you want me to get into it? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I just, I wanted to reiterate a point you hit right, right there real quick, because I think this can apply to every business. And that was you focused yeah, yeah. on, and you gave your attention to your really good client or your really good Absolutely. potential client. You know, that's something where I found myself years ago spending way too much time with like, I'll, I'll say low hanging fruit that just wasn't sure. worth my time instead of focusing on the really good clients. So that's great. And it obviously paid off for you. So yeah, what was the next step? How, how did that transition to your role? Elegant? Yeah, this is a funny thing in storytelling, right? Is like a lot of times in storytelling, you want to make each of these transitions really smooth and you want to feel like one thing led to another perfectly. But in reality, after a year of blogging for Elegant Themes from late 2013, oh, it was actually longer uh, to like 2000, the, the, late summer, early fall of 2015, um, I was kind of burnt out on blogging again because I was, you know, I was actually still getting storytelling work, uh, story consulting work. And that was actually starting to pick up finally to the point where I was like, ah, oh, maybe I could transition. And 
um, Nick said, or I, I, I emailed Nick and I just said, Hey man, I think I've written, you know, I've been doing this for six years now with, uh, with WordPress blogging. I think I've written every, I'm not a developer. So like my content is limited, you know, I can't dig into the code and write about that. I was like, so I think I've written every WordPress article I'm capable of about five times over. I'm kind of burnt out on it, man. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Um, you know, I, I want to give you a heads up, but I think I'm going to be moving on, you know, find a new adventure. And he just said, oh, that's too bad. You should stay. Uh, and he's like, you know, we're actually looking for someone to come on board and, and edit the blog. Would you be interested in becoming an editor? And I said, ah, uh, yeah, I mean, I would. That, that is more interesting to me at this point in my career because, like I said, you know, I'm just kind of like at the end of my rope on, on content ideas. Um, but I want something more than just writing words. I was like, how about we, how about we do a podcast? And that's how Divi Nation was born. So I was, was I was actually brought on 2015. 14, so yeah, I was actually 15. brought on to manage the blog, manage the freelancers contributing to the, to the blog and, um, and do the podcast. So I, I was basically doing one to two posts per week myself, the podcast, and then editing the blog. That was my job. That's a great segue to where Elegant Themes was back in 2015 mm -hmm. to where it yeah. is now. So let's talk about that. It, I don't know how specific you can get with numbers and stuff, but where I, I'm curious what the traffic was like to the Elegant Themes blog back then and how many authors you had as relation to what it is now. And then we can talk about sure. the whole journey with how you continued to, to build it and where things are at now. But yeah, what did it look like back then in 2015? Yeah, I mean... Let me just pull up our analytic peak. Um, but we've actually done this before. Uh, with We've done some case studies at WordCamps where we've actually pulled up our analytics and talked about this. It's pretty mm. interesting. Um, is any of that but it was, in articles that I can link to in the show notes for this? Or is it I wish. You know, I don't know what it is, but every time I present at a WordCamp, somehow my presentation never ends up on WordPress.tv. I wonder why that is. I don't know. Oh, they got something against, or maybe something against elegant themes or Divi, huh? No, I, just I don't know. Think. Probably not, but probably yeah. it is. It does unfortunate though, because there's been several um, times I presented and I can't find any of my stuff on WordPress.tv. Mm. And in situations like this, I'm like, oh yeah, I did a presentation two years ago about that at WordCamp, whatever. Uh, but let's go back. So 2015. That was just for folks who are curious. That was just when Divi was kind of just picking up some steam. So it wasn't near what it is now. So I'm sure we'll talk about how important content strategy is alongside a product. But yeah, I'm just curious because I'd like to find out where the traffic and where the views and everything were then and then what they are now and then talk about what you've done consistently to kind of build that because I know it's, it's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, in 2015, our blog had already been so if you really want to get to the, uh, the big change for us on the blog, you have to go back to 2014. So let's go. Um, so 2015, we were doing about 900,000 page views a month. Um, and we peaked a few years ago, or not a few years ago, we peaked last year at like 2 million um, per month. And we've kind of waffled back and forth right you know under the two million mark since then we actually got hit with uh um it, google used to count you know all of those footer links like across the web with like mm. powered by elegant themes on like divi and stuff oh to yeah us. so that gave us crazy high seo juice like everything that we published had just all those backlink authority right but google de-emphasized that so we got hit not too terribly long ago with with like um just a huge dip in traffic because that authority was no longer granted to us on Google. So we're, we're like in the mid, you know, like one around 1 1.5 million per month now. Um, and we're trying to regain that by, well, we have a number of different strategies, but um, yeah, long story short, we, we went from back in 2014 January 2014 is when we began regular blogging, right? It was kind okay. of hit or miss blogging before then. But 2014, January was when we began to go, okay, we're going to blog every day. 
So we had 303,000 per month page views. And now we're close to 2 million. 2 million. Wow. So let's talk about what you guys did and what you've done to continue to, to grow that and build that. Obviously, to your point, you weren't doing the right, all the writing at that point. You started no, hiring no, more no. authors and kind of overseeing the blog. How many authors were contributing then? About, you know, kind of a guesstimate. Yeah. So like, I think when I took over the blog, as far as managing the day-to-day -day stuff, it was more like, uh, I think about 10, six to 10 bloggers contributing. And what's, what's it look like now? So at our high point, we had about 35 freelancers that were contributing and we had to actually, it became too much because not like, it, and it wasn't that we had too many people to manage. It was too many schedules that, you know, you couldn't predict, right? So like if everybody's a freelancer and you have this high, you know, two posts per day thing that you're trying to do, you can't really keep up with that if like in any given week almost everybody could be like oh i got another client project going on i got sick i'm on vacation whatever you need people whose first priority is your blog right and so we really had to at that point build a team and now we don't we might have a bunch of people who want to submit to us now maybe more than 35 but as far as people who were in contact with and who were depending on you know, it's, it's like a handful. It's, it's our gotcha. internal team for the most well, part. Well, and now I feel kind of bad because I started writing for the Elegant Themes blog in 2016. You, or uh, yeah, 2016, you approached me to help out with the Divi 100 series, which we'll talk about mm -hmm. here. And then, yeah, it was the case for me where it was just kind of something I was doing on the side. And, yeah. and now I haven't done nearly as much as I will. I would like to do more. And I know, <laughs> you know, hope, I think you'd probably allow me to pop on every once in a while. I definitely would like to do it more consistently. But I understand that for you, that's a very tough position to be in. If somebody's like, oh, I'll do a blog whenever I feel like it. Yeah. And I think as an editor, you know, especially when you're looking for community submissions or submissions from experts in the field, you know, people who have real world experience, you know, that comes with the territory. You can't take it personally. Um, you know, that was a strategic mistake or just a learning a bump along the road for us um, where we had to go, Oh, well we can't depend on, on these folks making us their top priority when they got a business to run, you know, like if we can find a way to work with them to kind of like get that knowledge out of their brain, get that experience out of their brain and onto the blog, that's great, but that can't be the thing that like we're depending on for a tight deadline. That's just not practical. So have you ever it was thought just about, more a lesson? Okay. Have you ever thought about doing like a segment or a time period of like a commitment? Because I the more and more I have conversations with people about content strategy and marketing, one of the best things that I've learned is to have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Particularly like you're the elegant themes content manager. Like content is your thing. So you're going to be doing mm -hmm. that every day for a long time. But yeah. folks like myself who I'm running a business, I have all this other stuff going on. I can't commit to doing a blog every day. But sure. when I started my tutorials for joshhall.co, I gave myself a window. I gave myself 12 weeks. I said, okay, once a week for 12 weeks, I'm going to do a, a video blog and a tutorial. You know, that way I had kind of an ending to that segment and then I could recharge and do it again. Have you ever thought about maybe having that sort of approach with freelancers or people who might commit for, you might say like three months or six months to help out with that? Um, so yeah, I've tried that before. Um, and again, it's, it's really like, I think particularly with folks who are running their own business, you can't always predict when you're going to need to be all hands on deck. Right. You know, so like, you know, maybe you, you right now at this stage in your, in your career, because you've hired some people under you and, and you can maybe buffer your time a little easier, you might be able to pull that off. But I found that a lot of folks who are still solo preneuring or freelancing or whatever, like they have great experience, particularly if they're doing like Divi tutorials on like how to do this or that with Divi, you know, they, they got their hands dirty with Divi on client work like every day. So they're great folks for that. But you know, even if I book them for a, a short stint, we could say that they're going to concentrate on it for a while. But then, you know, they get a text or an email from a client. They got another big project that comes along that wants to pay yeah. like five times what our tutorials pay because it's an actual full website build. What are they going to choose, you know? 
Sure. That's a good point. That's, and the good thing is to consider if people do have a blog where they want to hire people to do content marketing and things like that. I'm sure we'll talk about that here, but are you, do you essentially look for people who yeah, can make that almost their full-time job or at least a high priority? Is that how you get people into yeah. to doing blogging? Yeah. Our biggest priority is to build internal staff. That was a decision we made um, a little ways back. Our first hire was Mac, uh, who does lo- our video work, a lot of our video work. Mm-hmm. Um, we've since hired another video person, Matt, and, um, and we have three full-time staff bloggers and we've got a few staff bloggers in the interview process right now, um, hoping to expand our team. We've just found that the quality is so, so much better and the dependability for, for scheduling is, is there as well. So it's just, it's worth it in, in every sense for us consistency on both sides. I'm sure that's huge yeah. too. Let's talk huge. about Divi 100 because that's when the blog really exploded. You got For folks who mm-hmm. didn't use Divi at that time, Divi 100 was a series where basically it was a 100 days of Divi where every day there was a new tutorial or something in and around Divi. And that's actually when you, Nathan, approached me to help out. I think mm-hmm. I helped out at the tail end where I contributed some articles on things you can do with Divi and stuff like that. And that's when I started blogging more for Elliot Themes and where I kind of found my niche with more like some of the more story kind of stuff and some of the Mm -hmm. client relationship and all that kind of stuff. But how, how did Divi 100 come about and how, like, what did you see? How did that help grow the blog and just the Elegant Themes brand? Sure. I mean, Divi 100 was, is an idea Nick had and it came from, the success of uh, the 12 days of Divi blog series that they did when they were uh, launching Divi. So it was like they had launched Divi and then there was like, they did like 12 giveaways leading up to Christmas um, to promote it. And that was like pretty early on. I don't know the exact dates, but um, I think the 12 days Divi had happened like a month or two before I came on board. Uh, so <laughs> when it came time to, it was Divi 100 was leading up to a really big release. I forget which release that was three, three point four, maybe it was a, it was a huge one. One of the yeah, really big ones. Yeah. Sounds about right. Um, and, uh, and we just really wanted to do something that was going to blow people away and that was going to build as much hype as we possibly could. And so we decided that we were going to commit 100 full days on the blog to, um, to Divi only content, which was something we'd never done before. And it really was a breakthrough for us. And because, you know, our, our strategy on the blog up to that point was to gain people, to get new people exposed to Divi, right? So we weren't blogging about Divi because we wanted to introduce people to it. We were blogging about WordPress and be like, oh, if you're a WordPress user and you have this problem with WordPress, come check out this blog. And then while you're on the website, you'll discover that we make themes. This is, you know, our main theme is Divi, et cetera, et cetera. And that was great. It was working, but it was, we really did find out that it was just one piece to the puzzle, right? Like Mm. uh, we were kind of breaking one of the cardinal rules of blogging and not even thinking about it, which is right for your audience, you know? Um, And our audience, our entire customer base they're Divi users <laughs> and we weren't creating Divi specific content yet. And so that was really the first time that, uh, that we did that. And we just, I mean, it was noticeable like right away, like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, we've got this strategy that brings new people in the door, but once they're here, we don't have anything to like make them really loyal to just us. Like what's the to one engage, thing that to engage them even further. Yeah. Yeah. Product. So it's like, we get them in the door with, you know, now the strategy is get folks exposed to Divi with general WordPress content, design, really valuable design, marketing, and business content. And then once they become a customer, every single day, they've got a reason to come back to to our blog and stay engaged with our brand because we're giving them the best content on how to use this really powerful tool that they've purchased from us. That's a really important lesson on segmenting and categorizing blog posts too, because in your case, you were doing all WordPress blogs and you're like, crap, we need to have a Divi specific category. And then, yeah, you can just kind of feed those articles from there. Uh, Something I would love to hit on is at this point, I remember it was fall of 2016, you and I attended WordCamp in Columbus and Mm -hmm. it was at the tail end of Divi 100. You were managing a lot. And I'll never forget, if you don't mind talking about this, because I think it's really important. 
uh, I remember you came in and at one point I looked over and you were like green. I was like, dude, are you all right? And you're like, man, I might need to go to the hospital. I just, I am not feeling good. And it, I mean, from my perspective, it seemed like you just, I'm not going to say you were burnt out, but you were just kind of exhausted. Um, you did rebound yeah. from that fairly quickly. So can you just kind of talk about that from a perspective of like, did you just take too much on? Did you overcommit or what happened to where you got to a point? Because again, you did rebound very quickly. You were right back at it, yeah. which is a good kind of lesson learned. But <laughs> you got to a point yeah. where you were green Nathan, you were Nathan Greenweller for a little bit, man. Yeah. Like what happened there? Yeah. So that was, I mean, that, that's, that was a big turning point in, in my career in terms of the way that I manage my time and my boundaries. Um, Divi 100 was probably like the hardest stretch of my time here at Elegant Themes because, you know, we, we didn't have all the things that we now have established as systems and best practices and stuff from managing all the, all these things. And so, um, you know, we were doing, uh, two posts a day, I think for the first time ever. And one post a day was Divi. And it was, it was basically, we doubled, we had zero extra workers in terms of like people who were, whose top priority was the blog. Right. But we doubled our volume. And so anytime something fell through the cracks or something wasn't going to get down on time or we need an extra post or this or that, I was it. And I was doing it and I was working, you know, 16, plus hour days, like seven days a week for most of that Divi 100. And at the end of the Divi 100, I was getting married um, in October. Uh, So I had all that going on. And I just was way, way overexerted, way underrested, terrible, you know, dietary and eating habits during that time because I was just getting whatever I could. So no sleep, bad food, way overworked, way overstressed. Um, And yeah, I mean, I, I went to the hospital that day my blood pressure was through the roof. They're like, you gotta, they're like, you have to take it easy. I think one of the doctors was like, you have like, you have the blood pressure of like a 70 year old on the, on wall street right now. Wow. Like you need to chill. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was basically after that, you know, after I got back from the honeymoon, I just, you know, I started saying no a lot. I started saying, you know, Hey, uh, and this was really hard. Cause you know, like the CEO of your company is telling you, this is what I want to do. Can you go make that happen? Of course, you want the answer to always be yes, because you want to be that kind of a person who can deliver. But what I had to start doing was just realizing that, well, sure, that's possible, but only if we do X, Y, Z. You know, I think it's really tempting, especially for people who are, um, who think, who, who aspire to be high performers, who think they have a high capacity to just go, hey, I can do, yeah, yes, it's not that much more. I'll do it. I'll take it on. But you say that like 10 times and all of a sudden, you know, you're doing like three, four, five jobs and that's terrible for you. Um, yeah. And you're not doing any one of those jobs excellently. You're just barely getting by, you know? So you at that, what did you do immediately following that? Did you set some guidelines to your time? Obviously it sounds like you started resting, eating a little better. Yeah. Did you just set up something? And it sounded like the one thing that you said was you set up some practices, best practices and systems. And that all sounds like contributed to a more sustainable, consistent pace, which that's what I'm all about. And Tim yeah. Streifler in episode two t- said a quote that was absolute gold. And it was that consistency beats intensity. Because somebody can be mm. really, really intense and then what happens? Agree. They flame out immediately or yep. three to six months in. Whereas you go more consistently at a slower pace, work less hours because I'm all, all my students know I'm mm-hmm. all about working less than 35 hours or so. If you yeah. keep at a sustainable pace, it's, it's a long run game. Um, did yeah. you, the stuff that you learned at, immediately following that, did you apply that to the business as far as like, you know, how you run the blog, how you run content? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I made it a rule. It's like I always get a um, minimum eight hours sleep. Um, always, you know, get something like a walk in if, it, you know, try to get some kind of get outside a little bit. Um, obviously at that point, because it was such a, it had gotten to be such a big problem. I had to make that a real priority because my health was just in the gutter. Um, and then after that, you know, in terms of work, like you said, with limiting hours, I had to limit my hours, just say, you know, uh, I'm starting work at this time. I'm stopping work at this time. And that's it. If something's not done, you know, it's not like if, if I'm working 
all day and I'm on task and something's not done at the end of the day, you know, I'm not responsible for adding hours to the day. You know, like I'm not, you know, that's just outside of my wheelhouse. I can't, I'm not a magician, right? So I just started bumping things to the next day and updating the, uh, uh, up, you know, updating Nick or whoever I'm working with to say, hey, you know, this is taking longer than, than we initially thought. And what was cool about that is like once you start having that conversation, um, I think the fear is that, oh, well, then you're always going to be bumping things. Well, no, the, the reality is that you start learning how to accurately estimate real timetables. And so after a while, you just get more accurate at knowing how long something should really take when you're not killing yourself to get it done. And then you can quote that time at the beginning and, and then you're, you're back to being you know, the dependable deliverer, but you're just doing it on a realistic timetable. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good point. I found that same with web designs where, you know, like I've learned exactly what you said. I know now to give myself a buffer with every project. And more importantly, when clients ask for something additional that is either out of scope or something, I'm mm-hmm. much more confident to stand my ground and say, look, we can do this. To your point, like what you said to Nick, like, we can do this, but it's going to take this. It's going to take more time. It's going to take yeah. more money. Or it's going to take something else or we're going to have to rework something within a reasonable time. Because yeah, earlier in your career, I feel like for everybody, it's like you say yes to everything. You want to please your clients. You want to please the people you're working with. And it's very dangerous because burnout and you know completely wearing out is very real. And I advise people to yeah. be very cognizant of that early on. Learn to say no more. Mm-hmm. I mean, you do have to say yes more in the beginning, but you'll quickly get to a point where you have to start saying no more, set expectations. And I found most people are very... For like very uh, welcoming of that. Like with clients, I used to be terrified yeah. to tell a client like, it's going to cost more to do that. We didn't talk about that in, initially. But yeah, now yeah. I'm like, we can totally add a blog to your site, but we yeah. didn't cover that. And we, we're, we're going to need to do that as an additional cost or we could do it in a phase two. And, I, and, and, and then the client's like, oh yeah, I didn't realize how much work would be involved. Okay, cool. Yeah. And it seems yeah, like yeah. it goes a long way. Exactly. And it's really, that's all it is, is it's, owning up the fact that, you know, I think a lot of people, they know what they're doing within their work and, but they don't know what they're doing like across the table from a client. And that's a big deal. And the same goes for internally, like with your, with your boss or your manager or whoever, um, you know, you're almost scared to stand up for what you, what you know and how you operate because, you know, I think there's this, uh, insecurity like, Oh, well, well, maybe I'm not right. And maybe they're so much better at this than I am that they're going to call me on my bullshit. And, and then it's right. going to be a problem. And then I'm going to look like an idiot. None of that's true. Um, well, maybe, maybe if, you're, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're playing yeah, the maybe. fake it till you make it and you've gone too far, then that might actually happen. But if you've been doing your job and you're, and you're confident in your abilities and you're doing, doing the work and you know that, hey, this is just the reality of the situation, you got like at a certain point, you just, you have to be willing to have that conversation with whoever you're reporting to, or you're going to get run into the ground and it's going to be miserable. The reason I like that we're talking about this right now, Nathan, is because it was almost three years ago. At the time we're recording this, we're recording this at the end of October in 2019. It was almost three years ago that that happened. So yeah. the cool thing about this is that I've seen the Elegant Themes blog and the content strategy in your career continue to progress very well to your point with the Elegant I mean the Elegant Themes traffic did not peak out there it continued to grow yeah. after you were working less hours it's wor- it's yeah. about working better hours not working more hours and so that's really cool to see that consistency and a sustainable pace can like you can do it you don't have to hustle 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 100%. hustle hustle until you run yourself into the ground so let's talk some practical strategies for folks because sure. again, like we talked, like you said in the beginning, most people are not going to be managing a blog that has 2 million views per month or whatever. Most people are not going to be managing a team of 30 plus writers, but all of these tactics and strategies can work for a blog that's smaller for businesses. So mm-hmm. um, what does your content strategy look like right now with elegant themes before we start talking about practical things? Like, are you guys still doing two posts a day, one for WordPress, one for Divi? You're doing Facebook, you're doing videos. What's, what's that all look like Mm -hmm. on average? Yeah. So like we're doing, let's see, I wrote it down here because I wanted to be able to 
kind of rattle it off here. So yeah, we're doing two blog posts per day, except for like feature release days. And those days we just do the one Divi post. Um, all of our blog posts have their own segments, which is really important for email. Um, we average one to two videos per day, uh, depending on length and complexity. Uh, we do three live streams per week um, uh, on the average week. And then all of our videos, they're done in house. So are the bulk of our Divi posts, but we do split um, our general WordPress design, business and marketing posts between one staff writer and, uh, and a few freelancers. Um, right now we have between four to eight freelancers, uh, depending on their availability and, and what we need. So I'm stressed out just thinking about that. <laughs> 730 <laughs> blog posts a year, not including yeah. the other content with videos and stuff. So yeah. you mentioned to me at the meetup, you're not really doing any writing now, right? You're more or less a project manager between everybody contributing. Is that right? Yeah. When you get to the scale, this is one of the things, you know, I had to learn about, you, you were going to ask me or you did, maybe you did ask me a bit about that transition between being a blogger and then being a content manager. And that was, you know, part of that Divi 100 learning curve was, well, clearly, you know, me doing the work every time something falls through is not working. Like that's too much for one person. So like, even though, you know, I think the more common version of that is like, when you start to delegate, start to build a team and you go, Hey, um, this post needs a few fixes. I'll just do it because I can yes. do it really fast and then it's yep. done. So, uh, I was doing that, but then when you've got that, you know, if you got 35 freelancers and even if you do that only half of the time, you know, uh, it still is something that that becomes your job. You're still doing the work of the blogger instead of doing the work of managing the process, managing the calendar. And trust me, that stuff is a full-time job. And if you try to tack that on to um, actually having your hands in, directly in the content as well, I mean, you're going you're gonna to be, again, you're going to be overworked, you're going to be stressed, you're going to be miserable, and, the, and everything will suffer. So I started having this hard rule of no matter how small the change no matter how small the note is, I bump it back to the blogger. And the only reason I did that was because it's like, you know, yeah, sure, maybe it's just this thing, but you never know. Just like in web design, you think it's just a little tweak, but then you spend like 30 minutes getting it just right. You know what I mean? And right. so it's like, I just had that rule. It's like, hey, here's the note. I'm not working on the note. It's like their job is to, to address the note and bring it back to me fixed. That way, I don't even get into the whole, oh, maybe I have time for it, maybe I don't have time for it. And I actually stay focused on my, my job and you know they, they do theirs. That's one of the biggest lessons I've learned in scaling my business. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's such an important rule. You do, when you start to scale a business and you go from working in the business to on the business, yep. you get to a point where like maybe at first, yeah, you have to dabble in, you know, like in my case, my, my lead designer, Jonathan, he started helping out with all of our ongoing edits and things like that. And for a while, I would keep on doing small edits on sites. But I got to the point where I realized, you know what? I have to pass this on. And no matter how small the change is, that's, that's his role now. Like that's what he, mm -hmm. that's not my position anymore. I am in a different position. And part of me, like, I don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes I still feel kind of bad, even if it's something quick. Cause I'm like, yeah, I'll email sure. Jonathan. Hey, I need to, need to change this link. Like I could do that. It might take me five minutes or less, but it's the premise. It's the moral of the story yeah. of you, when you are moving up in a, in a position or you're taking on different roles, you have to do that because I found too, to your point, all those little things add up. And yeah, if I am, if, if I'm doing all the little edits on stuff, nobody's thinking big picture, no one's running the business, no one's working, doing the jobs that only I can do in the business. So yeah, that's a good lesson that you have yeah. to hand that off when you start delegating, no matter how simple or easy it sounds. So that's a really good yeah. lesson. Now, okay, so it's good to know, I think, you know, and it, it's interesting, Nathan, now that I think about this, as crazy as that situation was where you were essentially just overworked and done for, for a little period, I think that probably behooved you because before Elegant Themes really took off, I mean, it really took off yeah. you know, between six, 15 and 16 and 17. I mean, I have seen Elegant Themes just explode since then. Even just the numbers on the front of the website where it's like, you know, at one yeah. point it was like 400,000 customers. customers. 
I look a few months later, it's like 500,000. I'm like, holy crap, yeah. like it just it yeah. exploded. <laughs> so it's probably good that that happened then because you could right. have been in a position where you, the company was growing so fast and just couldn't, couldn't keep up with it. So that's awesome. That's good to know. Like again, I, and I'm, I'm honestly, I'm proud of you and I'm excited for you that you've made those changes <laughs> well, and you stuck you. with it. Cause I've seen you, I've seen you stay consistent. I've seen you not burn out since then, you know, which is, which is impressive. Most, I found yeah, most people yeah. in blogging and any sort of content marketing fizzle out after a little while. Um, so what are some practical things that people can do in regards to, to content marketing? I know that well, I interviewed you for Divi Nation and I'll post the link to that because you had some really good points, sure. but um, you talked about so far using story and um, talking about that with, you know, using a story within content. Uh, you talked about making sure you talk to your audience and because mm -hmm. I think it's sometimes inevitably you're in a business, you just, you forget kind of where you are and what, where the need is. What are some other really important tactics or strategies that you would recommend for people who are interested in blogging for their sites or offering content for their clients? Yeah, sure. So, um, First and foremost, I mean, I, I have this like way of looking at it. You know, I think people think of themselves when they start to blog, especially if they're really into the craft of blogging, like, like so many of us are, they think of themselves as an artist. They think of themselves as like, oh, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create something really amazing. Like a, it's, it's beautiful. It's special. It's an expression of who I am and what I know. And I think that's the wrong approach. Um, I think first and foremost, you want to be a scientist um, instead of an artist. And the reason being is because uh, not only does that scientific aspect give you um, a view into how, how the platform works, like with, with data and metrics and, and all that good stuff, but you know, Art is very subjective. Something that appeals to one person may not appeal to another person. But if you're thinking about what makes people tick and you're looking at that information, which is why I so love stories, um, you really start to get an idea of what will make people um, engage. And so, uh, and I also want to note that on the storytelling thing, I think so many people make this mistake when they get into this idea of like, I'm going to use storytelling in my, in my blogging or in my marketing. Uh, they think, oh, well, of course, to do that, I need to start, you know, my post with once upon a time, here's an anecdote, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not what that means at all. Um, so like, it's the structure, it's how, it's the, the things that make stories compelling. There are components there, like, uh, like the structure of a narrative, like what makes a narrative go from one thing to the next and what makes someone compelled to follow that thing. It's learning those principles and learning how to apply those in context and create those touch points. That is what, you know, people who know what they're talking about when it comes to storytelling and marketing or storytelling content creation. And that that's can, what they mean, but that's not what most people hear. So in the case of tutorials, I'm just thinking practically that would look like, hey, this is, you know, like when I was doing a Divi tutorial, I would say, this is you know, what we're going to do, this is how it's going to help you. This is what you're going to become, like you're going to become a more confident designer or whatever. Then we get to the goods of here's the problem, here's the solution. And after showing you how to do this by the end, you're now more informed, you can pull off this effect and you have something you can use to the site. Is that kind of what you mean? Like thinking more uh, about sure. something I mean, as far as like- That can be part of it. Yeah, that can be part of it. But really, you know, I think you have to look bigger picture. Um, you're not, like your overall marketing message across the board, you know, should be- tracking, you know, your customer journey, right? So like in, in storytelling and, you know, go to Joseph Campbell, you have the hero's journey. And that hero's journey is actually just a big metaphor for the progression and growth of a human being, the transformation of one state to another state. So uh, if say someone is in the process of becoming a freelancer and they're transitioning out of their, out of, out of like a nine to five job, there is a journey that they're going to take and if you if you can kind of map roughly map that journey out, you know, and, and the 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 things that they're going to be um, excited about, insecure about, etc. Instead of trying to tell the story, you can just insert content that is relevant to that psychological place within the story, and you can help guide them through that journey and say, oh, hey, you know, you need that little call to action to help get you out the door from. Um, 
you know, from someone who's considering taking that leap to someone who's actually taken it. Well, here, let me, here's some content to help you do that. And then, oh, you've just done that. Well, now you probably need a friend in the business. I can be that friend in the business. And here's some content that will help you feel that way. Um, Oh, you know, at this stage, you're probably running into these problems. You know, I know that because I've been there. And here's a tutorial on all of those problems. That's what I mean by using the principles of storytelling. It's, it's really about understanding the psychological relevancy of different stages in someone's process, um, someone's journey in their life, and where that intersects with your business. And I think you're hitting on an important point from uh, story, the book Story Brand, whereas when you're posting content, whether you're doing courses or you're, you're doing a service or, or any type of business, you are the guide. Your client yeah. or your customer is the hero. They, they have a yep. terrible website. They want to have a good website. You are the guide that has to help them get to that point. So I think that's yeah. an important stance to take too, whereas sometimes it can be easy to come across like a hero when you're doing blog posts. Here's what we did, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, yeah, if yeah. you come across as a guide, is like, which is what you guys have done consistently with WordPress and Divi, here's you know, some experience, here's some results, here's how to get there, here's how to up your game. Yeah, always think of it like uh, that scene in Lord of the Rings, uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, they're all sitting around that table, they've got the ring in the middle, and Frodo, I mean, I'm getting geeky here, so I, I everybody's seen I Lord almost, of the Ring. So I was, it, I was not surprised. like, I'll take the ring, <laughs> and everybody else is like, I will help you take that ring. Like, I'll, as long as the, uh, Gandalf has the best line, and he's like, as long as the burden is yours to bear, I will help you. And that's the role of your brand. You know, you look at the cut, you look at your, your customer, your audience, and you say, I recognize the thing that you're trying to do, and it is your thing to do, but I'll help. I'll support I'm not, you. I'm not surprised you threw a, a Lord of the Rings reference in there, and that is all right <laughs> with me, man. <laughs> One question I did have uh, going back to you said being more scientific opposed to being artistic. That was really interesting. Do you mean like look at analytics and look at things that actually show yeah. you like, okay, here's, wow, okay. Because yeah, I guess if you're really artistic, you just do what you want. You're not really focused on what's actually yeah. happening. You're worried about like it being an expression of yourself, of your ideas and your, and that's all great. You can actually add that later if you want. Like I think of it as like a pyramid, right? Like you want to do like the very bottom of your pyramid, if there's three layers in it, should be you as a scientist. Then the middle layer is like you as a as like a um, like a craftsman, and you're just doing the best practices, and you're learning from other people in terms of like style and all that stuff. And then at the top of that is like your your personal creative flair, like the things that make you unique, right? But if you don't have those bottom two layers, and you only have that uniqueness. You know, you can create some of the best content in the world, but if nobody gets their eyes on it because you don't know how to do SEO, man, who you know, who cares at the end of the day? Like it's That's just a really lost good point. in the void. That's a great point. I think that translates to web design so practically because how yeah. many people, how many designers who are amazing designers, they build a website for them, not for their client. Right. And then the client's like, right. where's, yeah. the, where, where's the phone number? I want people to call me. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's, you know, we, we want to drop it. But, you know, there's little things like that yeah. where it's like, yeah, I think that's, wow, that's really interesting. Scientists build on that as a craftsman, craftsman and then artist. add your artistic flair. I like that. Yeah. Scientist, craftsman, Science, artist. craftsman, artist. Craftsman is somebody who just looks at the, uh, looks at the task ahead you know, they, there may be, they might be working under somebody else. So they have like systems and, and they have like a framework to follow. And if you're doing things for yourself, you know, that's part of my, my, uh, my whole thing. And it's part of what you do so well, you know, have systems, have processes, have a style guide. And that becomes your craftsman stage is once you've done the scientific work, once you know what angle you're attacking this from, why it's going to be appealing to SC for, for search engines, why it's going to perform well or answer questions that a lot of people have, um, how, you know, where you're placing, you know, specific tags and specific um, headings to get the best scores for your SEO, all that good stuff. Then it comes to craftsmen, you know, following your style guide, getting things to look right, getting things to feel right, following your language uh, guidelines, following your formatting guidelines, et cetera. And then, then the artistic stuff on top, like the things that 
that you bring to the table that no one else can. But that should really be, in all honesty, like the last thing. Like you don't, if you, you can, it's a, it's, it's a trap to think that that's the thing that matters the most. It will, it will shoot you in the foot. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I've just seen that happen so many times with particularly graphic designers who will come in, they just, you know, have their own flair and their design. But again, if you're not thinking big picture or to your point, if you don't have that scientific or craftsman mind about it, yeah, it's only going to get so far. And when budgets come into play and deadlines, that's when things really need to be handled differently. So yeah. Um, yeah. what would you say when you think about a content marketing strategy with blogs and video, I'm, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, cause I think what's overwhelming about that is there's no right or wrong. It depends on the business. It depends on budget. It depends on what you want to do. Do you recommend for people who want to start a blog or who want to get into more content marketing, do you recommend starting small and maybe do things consistently and then build on there? Do you recommend having a versatile (laughs) content strategy? Yeah. I'm curious as to what you would recommend there. Yeah. Starting off, I would recommend um, finding you know, identify your topic, like niche down, all that stuff. We don't need to get into it. Once you know what you're blogging about, once you know what your objective is, go out and find who's doing it the best in the world right now. Go to Moz, go to SEM Rush. Use these competitive analytics tools to really zero in on what these people are doing really well which pieces of evergreen content are the most valuable for them. And evergreen is really important because at this early stage, you don't want to be topical. You don't want to be day to day. You don't want to be doing this kind of tune in tomorrow because it's, it's too much too fast. So my thing is find the say top 20, top 25 most important Keywords, most important evergreen cornerstone style posts for, for what you do on the web and write those up first. And, and don't worry about how long it takes to get them right. Just worry about getting them right. Publish them. I mean, try to be, I mean, consistency is really important. So yes, you know, once you figure out kind of how long it's taking, don't be afraid to write a few and keep them in your back pocket until you figure that out before publishing. Um, and don't neglect um, everything after publishing too, right? So like in your process, make sure that part of your, your overall process for getting content out the door is, uh, includes your marketing of that content. So like don't be rushing off to the next piece of content before you've actually marketed the stuff that you've already done. So anyway, so get, get those like big pieces of content squared away and then start gauging the response to that. Those are going to be the things that you want to take care of in your archive anyway, forever. So you want to make them really good off the bat. And then you want to keep an eye on their performance as you go. But once you start seeing how people respond, maybe, maybe you can use these as a way to build rapport with your, with your specific audience. Like if they're leaving comments with questions on your blog, then that's someone tuning into you asking you a specific question. If you publish that post, they're going to read it, you know? So uh, start with what really, really matters and then, and then build from that both uh, in terms of branching off with SEO and with responding to your audience for requests and things like that. The, the cool thing about that too is what, like I started blogging in my tutorials and I already had a fairly decent audience growing. So I didn't mm-hmm. start, you know, cause I was, I was doing elegant themes blogs first, which kind of gave me some notoriety. Thanks to you, Nathan, for getting me plugged in with that. <laughs> but for people who don't have any audience, the cool thing about that is that strategy can work for 10 people just like it can work for a thousand. So yes. if 10 people read your blog post and three comment, 30% engagement, that's not too shabby. It's huge. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like a thousand people with hundreds of people engaging is, is huge. So that's an important thing to remember for people who are, you know, starting with very little or no audience. Um, when yeah. you talk about evergreen content, for folks who aren't familiar with that term, are you speaking of more things that are like timeless and just something that can be built up over time as opposed to a topic that is going to be obsolete, you know, soon after? Is that kind of what you mean by that? Yeah, exactly. Like something, uh, the way I look at it is if something is principles based, it's evergreen. If something is uh, liable to change with the next feature update on something or whatever, then it's, it's more uh, what I would call topical. Um, but your evergreen stuff is principles based. So 
uh, if something's almost always true, no matter what updates or changes happen, that's the stuff that you really want to nail. You want to get it, you know, as high quality as possible. It has to be better than the competition has to be ranking as high as you can get it. And then what you do then is when the practicality for how those principles play out, the specifics for how they play out change, that's its own tutorial, right? So it's like, you know, hey, here's how to design a logo, you know, the principles of what makes a good logo, right? But then like how you accomplish that has changed with like every iteration of, of design software. Um, you know, so that those are different tutorials, but that one thing and that is cornerstone and you actually link out to all the other stuff from there. I found that to be so true for all my content. In the case of my courses, my, my I just released my web design business course, which is all evergreen content. Like there's nothing yeah. in there that I'm really going to have to update because it's just practical tactics and lessons. It's not based yep. off certain um, like, or, you know, technology or whatever. Same thing with my web design process course. It's a 50 point process of web design from start to finish. Very little things in there would I ever really need to update unless, you know, a couple things change with search console sure. or things like that. Whereas my Divi beginners course, I'm getting ready to redo that because <laughs> I've got to revamp it for 4.0. I've got a ton of mm-hmm. tutorials that people are like, Hey, this doesn't work anymore. I'm like, crap, I'm going to have to go back and read it, redo that. So that hard lesson learned on my part with some of that as well. But yeah. that's good. That's good to think about, or at least, you know, if you're going to do because those tutorials are important for things that are recent relevant, but maybe have yeah. a different strategy to those with how you market exactly. them or how you support them. Don't shy away from that stuff because people really want to know. But you just have to be more careful about the timeliness, right? Like, um, you know, it. Say Gutenberg's getting ready to come out, um, and you've been watching uh, Google Trends to see, you know, the peaks and troughs of how interested people are. And right after it launches, you know, that's the time to go. Hey, here's how you do X, Y, Z with the brand new WordPress editor. Um, not, you know, two years down the line. <laughs> yeah, whereas, right. whereas if you create something on principles, it's as relevant today as it is tomorrow as it was yesterday. So you just got to be aware of, of timing when it comes to the, the stuff like the, you know, interface the, changes. The and, and Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, the cool thing is that there are pros to that being you have content that you can update fairly quickly, potentially, and then you have a whole new post that you can repost. Or like yep. in my case, I'm going to be kind of revamping a few of my courses. And now it's almost like I have a whole new product to launch again, you know, without yeah. having to recreate everything. So there are, there are pros to both methods for sure. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, you just this- have to choose your topical stuff very intentionally because it is going to be more work to maintain it. I mean, we have an archive of like 3000 posts plus a 70 plus article slash video archive of documentation for Divi. And a lot of that stuff needs updated all the time or it's just not working for us anymore. So um, it's just, you know, it's just something you got to be realistic of like what you're going to decide to manage, what you're going to decide to let kind of rot in the internet archive (laughs) um, and what stuff you're going to, you know, fight for. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And another thing I wanted to hit on too, that you mentioned was having a post post strategy. Uh, because yeah. I did that when I started blogging for my Intransit Studio site. I just threw up a couple blog posts and I was all excited. And then I, I published <laughs> and then I got two views on that. I was expecting at least <laughs> 20 or 30. Well, duh, I didn't let anybody know. I didn't even email anybody yeah. that I had a blog post out. So yeah, common sense, that's something that's easily overlooked. But you got to have a good strategy for sure for yeah. what to do with that content once it goes. So that's great. Absolutely. Well, Nathan, Nathan, this has been really good, man. I think we've covered some solid, solid topics and practical, tactical things. One last thing I wanted to ask you before we kind of wrap up here, because I know you've got plenty to do. Um, how do you, on a personal level, blogging can be very lonesome. Before we went live, we talked sure. about the importance of community. Um, yeah, This is probably a good time to talk about the Divi community with meetups and WordCamps mm-hmm. and things like that. But yeah, what do you, because most of the yelling at themes guys are, well, the, the, the operations staff and Nick and Mitch and all them, they're all in, in San Francisco or California. I know that there's a much bigger global team, but like, is that kind of difficult working with a team? Do you, you guys communicate through Slack and stuff like that to stay connected? Or what does that look like? Cause that's, that's gotta be kind of challenging, right? Yeah. It's a little challenging, but honestly, it's, I, I, I like the balance that we struck. We, 
we're on Slack all day, every day. So if we need each other, we, um, we have this rule that like, if you tell us, you know, cause the time, time zones and everything, you tell us when you're going to be online and then it's your job to be online and be available during that time. Well, that's so good. like, you know, for me, it's, you know, basically nine to five. And if somebody messages me during that time within a reasonable amount of time, I'm going to get right back to them. Um, and the same is true for everybody else. And then um, on top of that, you know, we have Monday morning content meetings where the whole editorial staff gets together on, uh, on Zoom and we, uh, we walk through our week. Everybody has to pull up Asana and say, this is what I'm working on this week. This is what you can expect from me. And then, you know, the, the expectation is that's actually what's going to happen. And if it's not going to happen, then that's when we're using Slack to get in touch with each other and that's and really just cool. those expectations. That's yeah. cool. So early in the week, you guys get together remotely and just talk about what's on tap. I imagine that goes back yeah. to the best practices and systems that are in place. That Absolutely. way you're not overwhelmed with stuff and yep. yeah, everyone knows. What and, and we've designed our, you know, this is a whole nother topic, but we've designed a really kind of complex, but very useful editorial workflow in Asana. Um, and so, you know, cause we had to account for, you know, the experience design of like, we have staffers, we have staffers who do just content. We have staffers who do just video. We have staffers who do video and uh, written content and, and images. Then we have community submissions and we have freelancers. All those people need a different workflow, different experience. And gotcha. we have collaboration with other teams. So like we have stuff that comes out from, that starts in the design team, like our freebies, and then it migrates to the content team. And we have mapped all that out in Asana with different project boards and editorial workflows. So that at any given time, ideally during the week, I can pop in Asana and go, okay, this is what we talked about in our meeting. I'm looking at, you know, the stage of the pro uh, project right now. And this is where, it, where it's at. Is this a problem? Do I need to talk to somebody? Well, it's typically here by now. So I'm gonna shoot them a quick message and go, hey, are we on track um, or not? Or I can just go, hey, that's great. No, no, need, to, no need to badger somebody. They're, they're doing everything the way they're supposed to. Everything looks good. Gotcha. And it's interesting. I was just thinking, you know, blogging and web design in general can be fairly lonesome, but I imagine as a content manager, maybe it's the opposite is lonesome because you're talking with people <laughs> constantly. And then you're at the end of the day, I'm sure you're like, all right, ready to hang out with a wife and read or do something else. You yeah. Know, that can be a lot, but it's definitely, you, yeah, definitely more contact. Yeah. And it's position yeah. in the blogger. Yeah. And I've, I've found that too, with growing my team now, I feel much more engaged with people rather than mm -hmm. when I was a solo freelancer, particularly being in the Divi community. And speaking of the Divi yep. community, you're big on meetups. Obviously you're, you're Absolutely. running, you know, we have, we just did a Columbus meetup. I'm looking forward to doing another one here soon. I imagine you want to really, I mean, I encourage people to get to meetups and word camps for that matter to, to keep involved because there's nothing like meeting somebody face to face and Absolutely. having real human connection. Yeah. Do you, yeah, 100%. Uh, a quick word on Divi meetups. Like, yeah, what's that look like for the meetups? I mean, they're popping up all over the place now, right? Yeah, we're, we're well over 4,000 people in the network. Um, we've got, I can pull it up here. Uh, we've got how many groups now? 46 groups. Um, let's see. 46 groups. 4,500 members, 15 different countries. Um, I mean, it's just been awesome to see, you know, the Divi, Divi community worldwide come together on a local level. I mean, I think that's so, so important because again, you know, it's one thing to, uh, to know that folks are out there. It's another thing to get in the same room with them and you really can't describe that. It's just something you got to experience. And I'm really glad that that's happening for, for more and more people. It used to be just a handful of people who would get together, um, you know, at, at a outside of a word camp, you know, once or twice a year. Now it's happening every single month all over the world. And it's just so cool to see. And the cool thing I've found with word, with uh, Divi meetups is, you know, when you meet other people at word camps, they're interested in WordPress and everything. But when you meet somebody yeah. who with Divi, they're passionate. Like they're even, it's yeah, like a whole yeah, other yeah. level of, of pumped up, you know, being pumped up and passionate about that. Very, very energizing. Absolutely. Awesome. And if just 
Well, I guess this will come out after, but we're getting ready to do one of our bigger ones, which is cool. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody at WordCamp US where we got a big meet and greet there. Should be around 60 people coming out, plus our staff, which is going to be just really cool. Yeah, yeah. This episode's going to drop just after that. But yeah, any, yeah, yeah. yeah, anytime you can get to a bigger event at a WordCamp with official Divi Meetup, it is, it's awesome. I'm bummed we're going to miss this year just because my second daughter is coming right around the corner. <laughs> so no, no traveling for the third trimester wifey. But uh, come on, priorities, man. <laughs> right, <laughs> priorities, right? <laughs> yeah, but those are awesome, man. Well, Nathan, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much for taking a decent amount of chunk here, your time of your day to to yeah. talk with us. I think this no is going to be really valuable. Love hearing your story, kind of hearing where you come from. Again, I just want to reiterate, I'm very glad to see after you know you <laughs> particularly being exhausted <laughs> at one point, rebounding yeah. and staying consistent. And the elegant things blog and content marketing is continuing to be a just a behemoth in the uh, the WordPress sphere. So that's awesome. Do you have any like a final note or anything you'd like to say to people um, who are either interested in blogging or want to get something from this? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I had something written down that we didn't really get to cover, but uh, it's a note that I feel like is really important because I, I, I've i been to, there's so many people who pull me aside at uh, WordCamps or just like when I meet them and they learn what I do and they're like, hey, you know, I've been blogging for ages and I'm, it's just going nowhere. I don't understand why. Um, and I'll be like, oh, sure, I'll take a look and pull up their blog. And, you know, it's, it's very obvious that like the blog post itself is just really underthought. It's really uh, like it's almost like uh, it was hammered out in a few minutes. Um, like, you know, no images, no video, uh, very few headings. And I just want to say there's, you know, there really is no substitute for quality. And, um, you know, to, to give you an idea of what I mean when I say quality, I'm not talking about like a couple hours, you know, like, you know, we have um, just a, take a look at any one of our Divi tutorials, you know, that can take two to three full work days to complete. And then it goes to our video specialist who will spend another one, one and a half days working on the video that will then go into that post. Um, and then we have a style guide that we've continued to, improve upon year over year so that every time we publish a post, it looks exactly the way it should. We have consistent formatting, uh, language, style, everything. And, you know, that's 36 hours plus, you know, that craftsman style, um, style guide that, that goes into it uh, for, for a single post, you know, by talented people who do this day in and day out, you know, that's what I mean when I mean quality. And if, and if you've been blogging for a long time and you feel like you're spinning your wheels, you know, maybe take a real hard look at like how much you're investing in the actual uh, content itself, you know, because you, you can do all the other stuff we've talked about. But, um, you know, if, if, if people aren't getting something really, really good from your stuff, then, you know, all, all that, everything else can be moot. It's a great point. Quality over quantity, right? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Awesome, Nathan. Great stuff, man. Super excited for everything that's going on. Keep on doing your thing. I have to thank you on behalf of myself and the whole Divi community for continuing to, to bring us together because I don't know if a lot of the Divi community would be as close-knit as it is without you and Nick and the guys who have really made that a priority elegant themes. It's still unmatched with other theme builders and other people <laughs> in the Divi community. So appreciate well, that, thank man. You. Thanks so much for your time. And I'm sure we'll have another conversation again soon. All right. Sounds great. I'm always inspired when I, when I get to chat with you. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Awesome, man. Cheers. Hey guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.